everybody. My name is Anu Fleming. I'm a speech language pathologist and I have been working for uh, 15 years and um, in a variety of settings. Let's see, I'm gonna see if I can, oh boy. There we go, there we go. Okay, so a uh, little bit about me. I am Canadian. I was born in Victoria, BC, Canada and I'm of Indian heritage. I speak English and Punjabi. Um, I went to, did my undergraduate degree in Victoria at the University of Victoria with, uh, in linguistics, uh, with the idea at that time of going into speech pathology. Um, but I did take a little bit of time off and then ended up doing a post baccalaureate at Western Washington University. And that was um, just kind of getting caught up on courses I needed to do the communication sciences and disorders program at Western Washington University and uh, become a speech language pathologist. So um, just a little bit of background on how I decided on speech therapy. I, um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do high school. I thought I wanted to be an English teacher and my parents really wanted me to do something in the medical field. And um, so my big sister sat me down and had a talk with me and um, she said, well, you know what? You need to talk to my friend who was a speech language pathologist. And I sat down with her and she told me what she did and it sounded great. And then, uh, so that's what I ended up doing. Um, and so there are two paths you can take with speech language pathology. Um, and once you get into the program, you kind of tend to sort of focus your program towards one or the other. And so there's um, the child speech language pathologist and adult speech language pathology. So some of you may be familiar with um, the speech language pathologists in the schools. Um, you may even have had the opportunity to meet or spend some time with them. So that would be one setting for a child speech language pathologist would be the school setting. Um, you also find speech language pathologists for children in hospitals, especially like Seattle Children's. Um, and the things that they would work on there very different from what you see in the schools. Um, and it might be more geared towards um, uh, their swallowing disorders, which I'll get to a little bit later, um, but sometimes babies have trouble swallowing and uh, they need a speech therapist to help them with that. Um, and then the other piece could be just changes with anatomy. Um, and those are just two of the things that the hospital speech therapist might work on. Uh, outpatient clinics are another big part of um, child speech therapy. Um, and there are many clinics all out there um, for a little bit of extra help if you need it. Private practice would be um, either at someone's own home or they would come to your home um, to provide speech therapy. And then home health for um, child speech therapists. Uh, I think Children's Hospital actually has their own program and they will send out speech therapists to the home to do visits, either follow-up visits from um, after a hospital stay or if there are any other concerns. And then of course, telepractice and especially now um, that's become another option for a setting. Um, I have not worked with children since I did um, all my clinicals at in university. I've primarily, my path was adults. And so uh, again, a lot, very, a lot of similarities there in terms of settings, hospitals being the obvious one and then skilled nursing facilities, that's a big one. Home health, which is what I'm doing now with Evergreen Hospital. And then the outpatient clinics, again, private practice and telepractice. Um, so let's see here, going down here. So what does a speech language pathologist do? So um, I'm gonna focus on adults and what you would do in an adult setting um, 
another uh, medical speech pathology is another way of looking at it that would also cover um, the hospital settings for child speech pathologists. But um, when working with adults, and that can be anyone 18 and over all the way to, I don't know, I think my oldest patient was 108. Um, you, of course, there's, there's three main, there's three main sort of sections of speech therapy. There's the obvious speech language communication piece. And I think that's what most people will think of. And, um, and then there's the disorders of swallowing and then there's cognition. So what I get a lot is I never expected to see a speech therapist. I don't have any problems talking. And it turns out that they've had some trouble swallowing. So that sort of fell into our camp because the muscles that we use for um, speech and language are almost the same muscles we use for swallowing. When you see changes in one area, you often see changes in the other. And so, um, so it's part of speech therapy and actually a very big part of speech therapy when you're working with adults. So going back to speech language communication, things you would expect, articulation, word production, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the communication piece working with either if somebody is not able to communicate verbally, then we would provide either a low tech or a high tech communication system. I have some that I'll show you guys uh, in a little bit. And then uh, disorders of swallowing, um, the, the diagnoses that you, you see a lot with any of these things, we're looking at stroke survivors, we're looking at folks with neurological diseases, so Parkinson's, MS, ALS, Huntington's. Um, and then oftentimes, when someone has had just any kind of illness that leaves them very deconditioned, these little muscles in here get very tired, just like all the other muscles and swallowing becomes difficult. So there can be a real variety of reasons that we're seeing someone for anything, speech language, swallowing, cognition. So the clinical assessment of swallowing um, is the hands-on assessment that you do, you might do it in a hospital at bedside or in a skilled nursing facility at bedside. For me, I'm doing it in people's homes. So wherever, living room, kitchen, bedroom, whatever. Um, and I'm actually gonna have you guys do something for me. I can't see you, but um, I'll have you put your hands on your throat right here. Just very gently, don't push and then swallow. And when you swallow, you'll feel your voice box go up and down, that's your larynx. And that's an important, really important part of swallowing. Uh, it tells us that the airway is being protected. We look at how fast the muscles are moving, how well it's coordinated, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then come up with a treatment plan and go from there. So just quickly, a modified barium swallow study, that is something that's done either in the hospital or um, it can be done elsewhere also. Um, anyway, uh, it is uh, done with barium, which is this thick stuff that tastes like chalk. Um, the person will swallow it, various consistencies, and then uh, it's an x-ray. And so we have to have a radiologist and um, we watch and we can see how, how the person's swallowing, if it's going down, if it's safe or if it's not safe. And then the fees, fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallow, that's typically done with an ear, nose, throat doctor and a speech language pathologist. And uh, it's a scope that goes up your nose and down to the back of your throat. And we can look with that camera and watch somebody swallow and see how, I think we were talking about swallowing and I was just finishing up about working with ENTs and that type of swallow assessment. Um, 
Okay, so that's speech, language, communication. And then the other really big piece we work on is cognition. And that includes attention, memory, visual spatial skills, problem solving. It looks quite a bit different with adult speech therapy than it does for um, kids. But again, we are working with folks who are stroke survivors or have had a some kind of traumatic brain injury, or again, there are a number of neurological diseases um, like Parkinson's and MS and others that can affect cognition. And so you're working with those folks as well. And it's really about coming up with functional ways to allow the person to um, maximize their daily life, uh, communicate with their family, friends, um, continue to do whatever interests or hobbies that they can um, in ways that are uh, easy for them. And hopefully they can still continue to enjoy um, the things that, that they've been working on. Um, there are sometimes we do work with younger folks who have are maybe stroke survivors or have had a motor vehicle accident of some kind and we work with them on getting um, back to work or um, as close to back to work or maybe even a new job if that's the case, um, whatever they need. Um, home health, uh, which is what I've been doing now for about eight years is primarily working with um, the older population. Most of the folks I work with are about 60 plus, um, but then we do uh, get some younger folks from time to time. Um, outpatient clinics and hospitals is where you would work with maybe the more 18 to 60 kind of um, age range. And then of course, if you're working in a skilled nursing facility, that's gonna be the older folks as well. And um, outpatient clinics. The one thing about outpatient clinics and adult speech therapy is that there aren't too many actually that um, offer therapy for adults and it comes down to what, um, what, the, uh, what your insurance is gonna cover. So um, insurance for adult speech therapy unfortunately is not great. Um, so yeah, that's something that needs to get fixed at some point, hopefully. Okay, so um, I'm going to just talk about, I, I tried to pick five things and kind of narrow it down that I really do love about being a speech language pathologist. Um, and I sort of listed them there from least to most, I guess. Uh, speech language pathology is considered um, a specialty even within the rehab world. So your rehab world is physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, um, sometimes recreational therapists if you're lucky, uh, social work, um, very uh, a good range of folks. And, um, and speech therapy is kind of a little specialty even among that. And, and so, um, the compensation is pretty good, generally, uh, even across settings. Um, and so that's a nice thing if you're thinking about a career and what, what you want to do. Um, and that's something that you want to consider. And then for, of course, the variety of settings, we talked about that already quite a bit. But um, uh, I have worked in all of the settings that I listed for you guys earlier. I've worked in the hospitals. I got to work in the VA here in uh, Seattle. I worked at Vancouver General up in Canada. Um, and then lots of SNFs throughout the area. That's skilled nursing facilities, sorry. And um, outpatient clinics, home health, which I've been doing for a very long time, which I absolutely love because... Um, I get to A, drive around, and it's great on a day like today when it's beautiful. Um, and uh, it's kind of nice to have that time in between your patients where it's just a little bit of downtime. Um, 
and I get to set my own schedule. So I'm home with the kids in the morning. It's important to me. I have two kids. Uh, it's very flexible. And that's a very nice thing about home health. Um, and then number three, I talked a little bit about the interdisciplinary teams. And so depending on your setting, you're going to work with a whole bunch of different people. In the hospitals, you will have the doctors, the nurses, uh, your whole rehab team. Um, I missed respiratory therapists when I was talking earlier, but that would be specific to hospital settings. Um, and you really do work in a group and we get together, we talk about the patients and everybody has a piece to contribute and you're learning from the physical therapists about what they've been doing. Um, they're learning from you. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's really interesting depending on the setting you're in, in the hospitals and in skilled nursing facilities, people still tend to be a bit separate and there's not a lot of overlap in terms of um, who's doing, who's, I mean, you're doing your job and nobody else is doing your job. In home health, sometimes you're the only clinician going out to see a patient and you are in that moment, whatever they need, the nurse, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, but you're really there to do your speech therapy. But sometimes you just have to put on a different hat and do the best that you can. And, um, and that's fun. And it's interesting and it's helping. And that kind of brings me down to the next point. Um, uh, one of the, my big things when I was planning a career and trying to decide. I knew I wanted to work with people. I knew I didn't want to be in a little cubicle or anything that just wasn't the way that I knew I would function well. And so that's definitely the very, very big part of, and kind of, I guess, two and one, those sort of go together. But the working with people, being of service to people in the community, I think I'm getting close to running out of time. Am I? We have until five after the next hour. Oh, good. Okay. So you have plenty of time. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Okay. So those are the five things that I love about being a speech therapist. And I brought a bunch of stuff today to show you. And I think that's kind of what, where we're at now. Um, uh, the American Speech and Hearing Association, if you do decide that this is something that you want to check out, that's a good resource. Just Google them. There's lots of great information there. And of course, you'll, you'll find a bunch of other stuff too when we get to it. But we can, that's it for my slides. And now I was going to jump into some other stuff here. So I don't know if I should close this down or leave it. I don't want to touch anything and wreck it. <laughs> You can leave the, you can leave your um, presentation up there and then. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So um, what I have to show you today are uh, some low tech, what we would consider low tech uh, communication and speech um, devices. And then I have um, a couple other little things that we display as well. All right. So first things first, this handy little gadget gadget is called a pocket talker and basically all it is is um a little microphone and then the headphones this goes on the person and then you can talk into it and they can hear you so it's when you have somebody who has had maybe a change in hearing but they don't have um hearing aids and that happens a lot uh, or they show up at your facility and their hearing aids are at home and they can't hear you and you can't do any work with them or therapy with them because they can't hear you. That's where one of these comes in super handy and they are very reasonable. And sometimes people prefer these to hearing aids. The problem with hearing aids, it's not a problem really, but what a lot of folks find with hearing aids is that the back the background noise and other noise factors, um, they just don't like it and they don't wanna wear them. But you got this on and you don't have a whole lot of other noise that you have to deal with and you can just hear whatever the person is saying to you. So 
pocket talker, quick and easy way to communicate with somebody. Um, and then for low tech communication devices, um, this is an alphabet board. It's one example. This is set up like it's a keyboard. And this work is going to work really well for somebody who um, is familiar with keyboards. So if you have someone who's never, who never typed, never worked on a computer, this is maybe not the best setup. And you want your alphabet to be maybe this A, a through Z set up in a different way. Um, and we would have, this would be something I would use with a stroke survivor or somebody who is losing their speech from due to a neurological disease. And they will uh, just type out, point to the letters. Um, and typically when you're using something like this, they don't, it's not quite as laborious as typing out the whole word because you can guess the word after a couple of letters sometimes. Um, but that's, a, that's an example of a quick, and low tech thing that you can just throw together if you need to or laminate it like this and they can keep it for however long. So one side we've got the alphabet board on the other side we've got pictures. Uh, another great way for the individual to be able to point or you would sort of point and have them say yes no because sometimes people can't always move their arms and limbs as they need to. Um, so those two are a couple of different, couple of different communication aids, and then, um, sorry, this is called a Dynavox. Did you have a good weekend? Did you have a good weekend? Did you have a good weekend? I hope you did. Um, so these devices are. Um, you may have seen them. Uh, lots of younger folks will have them. Students will have them if they need them. Um, and then for adults, um, same kind of setup except different sorts of words and phrases. These will have, this particular device has, um, you can either program in your own phrases. You, there's the keyboard option. So you can, oh, that's a different thing altogether. Um, you can type in something if you need to, and then it'll say it for you. Mm. Oh, it even pronounced my name right. That's great. Um, and then this is something that um, can be used either with direct touching. You can type it out if the person has the ability to do that. There are other ways that this a device like this can be accessed. Um, some folks will have um, a switch that either they move with their head. There's a sip and puff kind of device. That means it's like a straw that they would have in their mouth that they can kind of sip on. And then that will cause the thing to move around and you can formulate a whole sentence. Um, and then there's also, uh, let's see, there's the sip and puff and the, and there are the other little switches as well. If you just have like a little bit of finger movement, there's an other switches, so many different ways to access a device like that. They are really very expensive and um, insurance hopefully would cover it, but sometimes it doesn't but anyway. Uh, so oftentimes when that, type of device isn't an option. It's when we go to those other low tech kind of devices and go from there. Um, so those are the communication devices that you would use again, like I said, for stroke survivors or um, ALS, MS, not so much Parkinson's. I haven't really seen anybody with Parkinson's using a device like that, other than maybe an alphabet board. Um, traumatic brain injury, that would be another one. And then the only other thing that I have in terms of device is this. This is an electrolarynx. Um, so speech pathologists work quite a bit with 
um, survivors of head and neck cancer. Um, this is a device that would be used for somebody who's had their larynx removed, um, typically due to cancer, and it could be anything else, but there's a couple of little switches right here, which cause this to vibrate. The device itself is placed usually on the neck over on the side, maybe sort of right under here. And then uh, you press the button. I don't know if you guys could hear that. It's kind of weird through the computer. But this is something that a speech pathologist would, you know, post surgery um, when the individual was ready and the swelling from having your larynx removed is gone. You would work with them. Um, and teach use of this. Uh, we start at like word level and then sounds and then words and then go up to sentences. Um, and uh, now, I mean, those are, that's what we use, we've used for a long time, but there are also implants that can be put in um, and that's a whole different thing, but also very cool. Okay. So those are my gadgets. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, some of the things you might not maybe expect us to, to have in your speech therapy kind of toolbox. <laughs> but um, oftentimes I will use it any kind of game that um, has to do with words or word finding. So bananagrams, I use these all the time. Just grab a handful of the tiles and work with the folks. Um, anytime I can find games like this, Think and Think or this one, that's just another one. Uh, we'll, I've got a few of these we can try. Um, when you have a, a stroke, for example, uh, one of there's the term that we use for changes with um, speech and language is aphasia. Uh, that means that there's been some kind of change in how you communicate or how you understand language. So expressive aphasia would be having trouble saying the words or formulating the words or um, and that's where these kinds of things come in handy. So there's there's formal speech therapy that I would do. And then, you know, at the end of a session or in between, I might pull something like this out to kind of just give the person a little bit of a break, but they're still working. And it doesn't feel like work. And then the other fun thing is that this is something you can leave with family to do because it's easy and it's fun and everybody gets involved. Um, so, okay. Um, you guys want to try some? All right, we're gonna do the we're gonna do the that's it. Uh, the, what I have here are descriptions, and you have to come up with the object given the description. Um, to play the game properly, what you would do is you want to try to get whatever they have listed here to get the point. When I'm working with somebody, I'm not, uh, I'm just looking for them to come up with an object that fits the description. So it doesn't have to be the specific one. And what we do is like, for example, the first one is uh, a sport where you serve a ball. Okay. So what they've got here is volleyball, could be tennis. Um, and so if I am getting a sense that a person is trying to come up with a word, but they can't quite get it, um, I'm going to give them a variety of cues. And it might be a little bit more of a description. I might say, you know, something that you would have, there would be a net, and you might use a racket um, or something like that. And then if that doesn't work, that's when my whiteboard comes out, and I might write the first letter of the word to help them. Uh, visual cues are always great for folks. And then 
if they need if they need it, I might start with um, like a sound cue and say, oh, it starts with a V or a V and then have them say the word. And sometimes they might need help um, articulating the word. So you're gonna work on that piece. So you've got this game and all of a sudden you're working on working memory. You're working on um, problem solving, word finding, articulation. So a whole bunch of things that um, the uh, that are beneficial and um, you're kind of doing it in a way that's a little bit more fun and less boring. So, okay, I'm gonna, I'll throw some out and if you guys wanna speak up, go for it. If you wanna, I don't know if you wanna do it in the chat, you could do it that way. Are there any questions so far? I didn't ask if there were any questions yet. Are there any questions? I'm looking at the chat right now and uh, from Ashley, yes. uh, she says, how do you know you wanted to work with adults instead of children? Uh -huh. Good question, Ashley. Um, so it was, uh, well, okay. I think it was probably a movie that I watched a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it was a stroke survivor. It was about a stroke survivor who had somebody come and work with him. And, uh, and that just really appealed to me. But then once I got into the program, um, taking the classes and, and there's, there's, you know, you're not sort of stuck in one path from the beginning. So you have time as you're working through the program to make that decision about what you want to do. And in fact, any time in your career, you can make that switch. You just have to, you know, kind of go back and maybe relearn a couple of things. But um, uh, that was one thing, I think, for me. Um, and then also just the, the, the settings and um, that you work with with adults. I, I felt like there would be, for me, just more variety and it's what... I, I was I've always just always interested in the the neurological aspects, the stroke survivors, that kind of thing. So that was that was that one. Any other questions? The second part of that question is uh, oh. did you know before college or during any yeah. internships you may have completed? Did I know oh during college which which path I wanted to take? Yeah, I started out um, thinking that that would be my, the route that I would take would be working with adults. As I was going through it, my sister kind of kept saying, oh, you'd be great with kids. And I really had fun with kids. Um, uh, my favorite thing was, uh, it, this was when Harry Potter, the books were actually coming out, so not the movies. <laughs> And uh, I had a cauldron. I had this kid who was really into Harry Potter and we were putting words in the cauldron and working on his sounds. That was very fun. I, I knew that I would enjoy that. But I just really, I was always drawn towards the, um, the, med the medical side with adults. So even though I, mean, I was sort of started out knowing that I was going to do that. And then I feel like once I was doing it, it was, I, w I was convinced it kind of confirmed it during my clinicals. We have uh, about cool. four minutes remaining. Oh, okay, doke. Mm -hmm. uh, any and other Joe, questions? Uh, has a question. Uh, yeah. Basically, did you take running start or take? I did not. B classes or one B classes? So uh, I'm Canadian and we a little bit different. I mean, I graduated from high school in 91, so a little, a little bit ago. Uh, and then from there, I just went straight into university and did my undergraduate degree. And then, as I said earlier, I did take a little bit of time off there, um, realized that I, there wasn't much I could do with a bachelor's degree in linguistics. And, um, and then went and uh, ended up uh, down here in Bellingham. There are only six schools in Canada that offer um, speech therapy, and there are three in Washington State. So, um, so I ended up down here, which was good in the end. 
so far, no further questions. Okay. Do we have a minute or two or not really? We have about two more minutes and looks like another question just came through from oh, Ashley. Good. Okay. What sciences did you focus on in high school? Um, chemistry, biology, uh, did you take any AP classes? I didn't take any AP classes. I focused on, um, I focused on biology and chemistry. And then I did not take any more chemistry in my undergraduate, but I, bunch of biology, psych, and I had to take physics. 